The words we will study today are the words Jesus spoke to his disciples hours before the cross. He's headed to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now understand the disciples have followed him for over three years. Every time they had a question, Jesus was right there. They could just ask him. If they had a problem, he was just a few steps away. They had seen his miracles. They had heard him teach. And he just said, I'm going to leave you. They were heartbroken. He wanted to comfort their heart. He said in John chapter 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He comforts their heart with the thoughts of heaven and that this life is not the end. But that's not the only way that he comforts their hearts. He tells them, I'm not going to leave you without help. I'm going to give you the blessed Holy Spirit. And in these verses that we're going to study today, Jesus teaches the disciples the only way they could make it in this world is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sadly, in our day, many Christians and many churches are like the church that Paul came to in Acts chapter 19. They were doing all of the outward motions. They were saying the right words and singing the right songs. But something was missing. They had no life. They had no power. They had no fruit. In Acts chapter 19, verse 2, Paul asked them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And sadly, in 2008, there are many Christians just like that. They believe they received the Holy Ghost at salvation, but as far as living and depending upon Him every day for every need that they have, they don't. When we think about Christians today and churches today, the churches today, we have more money than we've ever had. We have more talent than we've ever had. We have more abilities than we've ever had. We have more tools than we've ever had. We have more programs than we ever had. And there's nothing wrong with money and there's nothing wrong with abilities and there's nothing wrong with education. There's nothing wrong with tools. There's nothing wrong with programs. But sadly, all of these things have taken the place of the blessed Holy Spirit. And while we have all of these activities and all of these things going on, we're powerless, we're fruitless, and we're not making the impact that we should be making in this world. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 tells us, It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my Spirit says the Lord. This morning I want you to see 10 characteristics of the Holy Spirit of God from John chapter 14. The sermon is entitled, The Truth About the Holy Spirit. Characteristic number one, notice the recipients of the Holy Spirit in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now understand, obedience is the mark of a true believer. They've accepted the Christ and they're ready to serve Him. They love Him and they want to serve their Savior. Now this is not a work salvation where you work for your salvation. You accept Christ by faith. But when you truly accept Him, when you truly accept Him by grace and through faith, there's evidence of that decision, and that's by obedience to his commands. Verse 15 tells us, If you love me, you will keep 
my commandments. The word keep means to watch over, to preserve, to guard. And this verse teaches us that we demonstrate our true love for Jesus, not by our positions, not necessarily by our titles or by our education. We demonstrate our love for Jesus by serving Him and keeping His commandments. Do you really love Jesus? If you do, you will obey Him. Understand, the Holy Spirit is only given to believers. You receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. The recipients of the Holy Spirit are believers. The second characteristic, notice in verse 16, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he says, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Now throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit had been promised in Isaiah chapter 44 verse three, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And literally he's saying, I will pour out my spirit. John the Baptist picked up this same promise in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And what he teaches us, that when the Holy Ghost is real and ruling in our lives, there will be fire and passion and excitement the promise of the Holy Spirit. The third characteristic I want you to see is the deity of the Holy Spirit. There again in verse 16, I will pray the Father and he shall give you, notice the next word, another comforter. Another means another of the same kind. Now there's two Greek words for another. One means another of a different kind. The other word means another of the same kind. For instance, Let's say that your mode of transportation was a bicycle and you decided you were gonna upgrade your transportation, so you upgraded to a horse. Well, that's another of a different kind. But if you decided, hey, I'm gonna get a different bicycle, but one just like the one I have now, that's another of the same kind. When Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, he didn't say he would send another of a different kind. He said, I will send you another just like me. And it's a reference to the Trinity. The Bible teaches that God is one God, but he reveals himself in three distinct personalities. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When we baptize, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. The attributes ascribed to God the Father and God the Son are ascribed to the Holy Spirit as well. Hebrews chapter 9 refers to Him as the eternal Spirit. Psalm 139 tells us He's omnipresent. Isaiah 40 tells us he's omniscient. Romans 15 tells us he's omnipotent. In all of the divine attributes, the Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. Now notice here in verse 16, all three persons of the Godhead are represented. And I will pray, Jesus is talking, the Father that's talking about God the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. That's talking about God the Holy Spirit. The deity of the Holy Spirit ought to be clearly recognized in Scripture. Christ was born. The Spirit was his forerunner. Christ was baptized. The Holy Spirit descended from heaven to bear witness of him. Christ was tempted. The Holy Spirit led him up to be tempted. Christ ascends. The Spirit comes and takes his place. The deity of the Holy Spirit. The fourth characteristic we see, the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Look on in verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, next word, comforter. Comforter is the Greek word paraclete. One called alongside to help. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He is our helper. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, 
My children, these things write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that word advocate is the same word as used in John 14, comforter. Jesus is our advocate in heaven. The Holy Spirit is the Father's advocate in our heart. Jesus represents us before God in heaven. The Holy Spirit represents God the Father in our, in our heart. He comes and he says, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. That's not right. That's wrong. That's sin. And he represents the Father's interest in our heart. The Holy Spirit helps us live the Christian life. The assistance of the Holy Spirit. Fifth characteristic, the permanence of of the Holy Spirit. Look on in the verse. And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now here's what that means. The Holy Spirit only comes into your life once. He doesn't come over and over and over again. He comes one time to abide and dwell with you forever. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is the strongest negative in the Greek language. I will never, under any circumstance, ever leave you nor forsake you. Now, there are certain groups that teach when your strength grows weak, you just know you need to go get more of the Holy Spirit. Listen very carefully. You received all of the Holy Spirit at salvation. But when your strength is weak, you don't need more of the Holy Spirit. You have it all. You need to surrender more of yourself to the Holy Spirit to control. Let me illustrate it like this. Let's say a, a husband heard that his mother-in-law had gone down health-wise and could no longer stay by herself. So he invited her to come and live with them. And she did. But once she arrived, he just didn't accept her. He didn't like her being there. He resented her being there. But she was in the home. She just didn't feel part of the family. Well, this husband felt convicted for his actions, went and apologized to her and said, I've treated you wrong. You are part of our family. We love you. Our home is your home. You can come as you wish. And so many times, that's the way we treat the Holy Spirit. He is there, but we leave him confined to a small portion of our life. And we say, don't come here. You're not welcome. And the secret to living the Christian life is letting the Holy Spirit live and control every part of your life. The permanence of the Holy Spirit the sixth characteristic. Notice the person of the Holy Spirit in verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person he is a real person. Jesus is a real person, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person that you love and you treat respectfully and you honor and you reverence. Now, in the Greek language, the word spirit is in the neuter form. Many languages have nouns as being either masculine or feminine with a few words left over that would be in the neuter form. The Spanish language does this. Well, you don't mix masculine adjectives with feminine nouns. Well, we come back to the Greek. In Greek, the word spirit is in the neuter form. So any pronoun associated with it must be in the neuter form as well. So any pronoun should be translated it. But when you come to the Bible and it refers to the Holy Spirit, it doesn't call the Holy Spirit an it. It calls him he or him. You say, why? Because the Holy Spirit of God 
is a person to be loved and cherished and appreciated. The Holy Spirit has a mind just like every person does. A person has a will, he can act. The Holy Spirit has a will, he can act. A person has emotion, he can feel. The Holy Spirit has emotion, he can feel. Romans chapter 8, verse 27, we see the Holy Spirit has a mind. He that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has a mind he can think. Not only that, the Holy Spirit has a will he can act. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, talking about spiritual gifts, this is what it says. But all these worketh the one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. He has a will he can act, but I also want you to see he has emotion he can feel. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's real. He's there for you to love and for you to cherish. He has a mind. He has will. He has emotion. The person of the Holy Spirit. The seventh characteristic, I want you to notice the presence of the Holy Spirit. Notice the last part of verse 17. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, I want to show you the difference between the Holy Spirit, how he came in Old Testament times, and how he came in New Testament times, and how he is here in our time. Before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit dwelt with believers. After Pentecost, he dwells in believers. Now, it's important for you to understand when we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, it does not mean the Holy Spirit wasn't here on the earth before Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has been active since creation. Do you remember Genesis chapter 1 verse 2? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit was present in creation. He was there and when man was created. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. The Holy Spirit was present at, with the inspiration of the Bible. For holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has been present since the beginning of the world, but things changed at Pentecost. You see, in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit dwelt with believers. He came on certain men for certain tasks at certain times. He dwelt with them. But after Pentecost, he comes to dwell in us. Now we think, what could be better than having Jesus to be with us at all times and in all places? Well, what could be better is to have Jesus in us. For you understand when Jesus was here on earth, he was voluntarily limited by time and space. He could only be in one place at one time. If he was in Nazareth, he couldn't be in Jerusalem at the same time. Do you know what's better than having Jesus right by our side? Having Jesus in our heart in the form of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this verse tells us. For he dwelleth with you, that is pre-Pentecost, and shall be in you, that is post-Pentecost. One other thought. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could be withdrawn. God's Spirit departed from King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Do you remember what David prayed in Psalm 51 verse 11? Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The presence of the Holy Spirit. He comes to live in us forever and ever and ever, the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
That's what 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 is talking about. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You have God's Spirit living inside of you when you accepted Christ as your personal Savior. The presence of the Holy Spirit. The eighth characteristic. Notice the power of the Holy Spirit. Look down at verse 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Jesus expresses the simplest words, but the most profound truth that can ever engage the mind of man. You and me. That is our first experience when we come to Christ. We are children of God, no longer children of the devil. You must understand, when God looks at Neil Jackson, he doesn't see Neil Jackson's righteousness. He doesn't see Neil Jackson's sin. He sees Christ. For I am in Christ. And that's what Paul meant when he says, I am crucified with Christ. We are in Christ. But take it one step deeper. Look on in the verse. Ye in me and I in you. It's not me living this Christian life. It's Christ living by power of the Holy Spirit through me. Listen to the rest of Paul's verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth through me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The power we have because Christ lives in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody put it like this. You might as well try to hear without ears or breathe without lungs as to try to live the Christian life without the Spirit of God in your heart. You say, Pastor, something's missing in my heart. I just don't have what you're talking about. I know I've accepted Christ, but I don't have it. Look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Loving obedience is the key to intimacy with him. Obedience is not difficult to those who love Christ. And you say, I want more Holy Spirit power in my life. The way you get it is surrender to him and obey him. Look what Judas says in verse 22. This is not Judas Iscariot. This is Judas, sometimes known as Thaddeus. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the words which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. And what he says, do you want more of the Holy Spirit? You can, but he's already there in your life. You need to surrender to him and you can have more of his power. Surrender and obedience is the key to intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The ninth characteristic, notice the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Every time a child of God opens up the Word of God, the Spirit of God speaks and teaches us what is truth.
the Spirit gave, it gives the same lessons that Jesus gave when He was here. He brings to remembrance things that we forget. You cannot understand the Bible without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's why in verse 17, he is called the spirit of truth. He is absolute truth and you can totally and completely trust him. Now, let me show you this. Hold your place there in John chapter 14. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And what he says, you can't even imagine how great heaven is going to be. And all of that is true. But Paul is saying, you don't understand heaven with your eyes. And you don't understand heaven with your ears. And you can't understand heaven with your heart. Look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. But God hath, not will, it's not future, it's not by and by. The Holy Spirit teaches and discerns and helps us to understand the deep things of God, things that we could not learn with our eyes and our ears in our heart, the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And the tenth characteristic we see, the peace of the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus is saying, I will give you the very peace that I have. Understand, Jesus is hours away from the cross. He's ready to be beaten. He is getting ready to be mocked and scorned and crucified. And there was no anxiety. And he says, I give you this peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I want that Holy Spirit power in my life. I realize I got the Holy Spirit at salvation, but I want His power. How do I get it? The way you get it is surrender. The way you get it is by coming to the Holy Spirit and to God every day and saying, I surrender this area. I need you. And He will give it to you. A group of preachers were meeting in a certain city discussing the possibility of having an evangelistic campaign. And they were talking about, should they bring in that preacher, D.L. Moody? One young person stood up and said, why should we bring in Moody? Does Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? There was silence. Then another preacher stood up, says Moody doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. And my friend, that's the secret to the Christian life. Letting the Holy Spirit control every part of your life, your words, your actions, your thoughts, your deeds. Look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Having heard this great teaching, Judas, also known as Thaddeus, says in verse 22, Lord, how is it that thou will not manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus, this is great, this is wonderful, but you're not going to let the world know about the Holy Spirit? You're not going to give this gift and let the world know about it? Notice how tenderly Jesus responds in verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Judas, also known as Thaddeus, never got over these words. This is really the only time we find him speaking in the Bible. 
Eusebius tells us that a few years after Pentecost, he went north to Mesopotamia, taking the gospel and taking the power of the Holy Spirit. He came to a small town. There was a king of this this country, this small town, named Abgar, king of Edessa. History tells us that he was dying, and Judas, also known as Thaddeus, came and shared the gospel with him and prayed that the Holy Spirit would heal him. The Holy Spirit did heal him, and he rose to reign again, and he accepted Christ as his personal Savior. Well, when he accepted Christ as his Savior, it caused havoc in the country. The king's nephew came to Judas, also known as Thaddeus, and said, you must recount that Christ or we will kill you. This is what he said. I cannot live without Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And they took clubs and they beat him to death. He had rather die than live without the Holy Spirit's power. Oh, that would be, that would be the prayer of our hearts.